listeners, readers, welcome back to this Fox Page exploration of Nancy Mitford's unbelievable The Pursuit of Love. This is the third installment of the three-part segment uh, on Nancy Mitford's book. So if you've missed parts one and two, you might want to go back and listen to them. Uh, but this is part three. Today, we're going to talk about maternity in the novel. We're going to talk about humor, which I think Nancy Mitford does better than a, a lot of uh, writers I can think of. Then we're going to talk about the, the, the way that comedy is really deftly balanced with real pathos in this book. And then we'll look at the close of the novel. Okay, so one of the, the, the sort of strains of the novel that really stuck out to me in this, which is probably, I don't know, my fourth reading of the novel, was the depiction of maternity. I don't know if you guys are Veep watchers, but I love the depiction of Selena and the way that she is such a terrible, terrible mother to poor Catherine. I also am a big Succession fan, and I honestly can't get enough of that terrible Caroline um, and how she treats her children so, so badly. I think I, um, you know, in my striving to be such a great mom, it's it's really fun to watch women who just really don't give a shit and really do exactly what they want to do. So we have a very good example of that in the bolter in this book. And we also have that early example of Aunt Sadie, you know, holding the baby, even though this is her sixth child and just sort of like, seeming like she's about ready to hand this baby off to a uh, nanny who cannot be far from, uh, you know, outside the frame of the photograph. But we have a, a very interesting take on maternity in the introduction by Zoe Heller. So this is on page 17, um, little Roman numeral 17 up there. I realized one of my children, probably all three of them, cannot read Roman numerals. Speaking of uneducated children, they're like practically radlets. I mean, they're not actually, but you know, in terms of education of Roman numerals. Okay, so in the middle here of the page, it, this is Zoe Heller talking about maternity. Any number of modern novelists might take on the daring task of depicting a heroine who rejects her newborn, but the chances are that they would psychologize the act, would ask the reader to enter into the horror and shame of not wanting one's child and so on. Mitford does none of that. She asks us instead to laugh at Linda's jokes about the hideousness of little Moira and to accept that in the long run, the child will be much better off with her stepmother, the ghastly blue-haired pixie Fairweather. Children in Mitzford's fiction are remarkably hardy, cynical little creatures. It's a little reminiscent of Salinger and, and all the glass kids and, and, and sort of their maturity. And it is true, you know, we have a very good example of a child who has really thrived with a surrogate mother in the case of Fanny. You know, our narrator is actually someone who is an example of, of you know, having been abandoned for all intents and purposes by her mother and having been left with a substitute. Uh, so we're going to look at 93 because I think this is some of the, the my favorite writing. Uh, and also, again, I cannot recommend highly enough the BBC adaptation uh, with Lily James you can watch it on Amazon Prime. They, it's the 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 parts when she has just given birth to the baby. The scene is it's so so good. So here we have, and it's interesting. I was gonna, I could talk for ninety minutes about this. Um, I was gonna have a section. Lots of of the adaptation is taken verbatim from the dialogue in the text, and you realize how incredible her dialogue is because. As I like to remind everyone, we are living in the platinum age of television and television writing is some of the very best writing we're seeing. And yet they are just pulling Nancy Mitford directly from the page and it's absolutely stunning writing uh, for television. So on page uh, 93 and four, this is when cute Fanny has come to visit our uh, Linda who has just had baby Moira. And she tells her the name is baby is Moira. All the same, I don't see how you can saddle the poor little thing with a name like Moira. It's too unkind. By the way, Moira means destiny or fate. Uh, it is an Irish name, which interestingly, um, you know, Tony Krasig, he's of German descent. So my sense is like maybe the Krasigs don't understand that maybe there's a class issue here. I would imagine that choosing a very Irish name for your young British baby uh, in this day and age would maybe not be, um, just given 
weird, terrible, classist ideas about Ireland and England, um, this might not be the most flattering thing. So then uh, Linda speaks. Not really, if you think. It'll have to grow up a Moira if the Krasigs are going to like it. People always grow up, grow up to their names, I've noticed, and they might as well like it. When she's saying it, she means the baby. And they might as well like it because, frankly, I don't. So she's saying right from the start, like, the Krasigs better like this baby because, frankly, I don't like the baby. And again, it's this kind of outspoken, um, you know, she just so fully owns it. And, and there's lots of tension between whether she's like the Bolter or whether she's not. And in fact, in lots of ways she is, which allows us, you know, also to have sympathy for the independence and the decisions of the Bolter. But here she's very outspoken about not liking this baby. Linda, how can you be so naughty in any way? You can't possibly tell whether you like her or not yet, I ventured. Oh, yes, I can. I can always tell if I like people from the start and I don't like Moira. That's all. She's a fearful counter Han. Wait till you see her. So it's so funny. Their enemies are, you know, they're the Hans and then their enemies are the counter Hans. It just is so funny that, that this is an infant, you know, who's maybe a few days old. And, and she's saying she's a fearful counter Han. Wait till you see her. And then down a little bit further, um, they're talking about the nurse. She went away and presently returned carrying a Moses basket full of whales. Poor thing, said Linda indifferently. It's really kinder not to look. Don't pay any attention to her, said the sister, the sister with a capital S being the nun. She pretends to be a wicked woman, but it's all put on. So just a quick note on wicked there. They keep saying earlier how they, how like you're so lucky having wicked parents. There is this, this refrain again of even just that word that's beautiful because here she's, she's not even being a wicked parent. She's just like, I'm, I am, I'm out. I'm not interested in, in raising this, this baby or, or the baby is not kind of resonating <laughs> with me. Um, uh, I did look and deep, this is Fanny looking down into the Moses basket full of whales. Uh, I did look and deep down among the frills and lace, there was the usual horrid sight of a howling orange in a fine black wig. So I love this in large part because again, it's so bold. It's very much like Veep where you just are like, wow, they are really letting Selena Meyer just go for it in terms of being a terrible, terrible parent. It's like you have this accumulation here of these women as just sort of one upping each other for like who can be the more kind of horrible. Uh, I mean, at least I think Fanny is is welcoming the idea of, of seeing whether or not you like her. But this idea of the, of the orange with the fine black wig, it's so unappealing. Uh, and Fanny, you know, goes on to have three children and even then a fourth and she adopts Fabrice young Fabrice, but it, so, so there is this idea of her as being relatively content as a parent, but I love the fact that she can really get on board here with how infants are just not particularly interesting, at least to these two women. Um, and then a little later, Linda says, poor soul, I think it must have caught sight of itself in a glass. Do take it away, sister. So again, you I mean, it just keeps coming. You know, the hits keep coming. And in fact, Linda does prove to be a pretty terrible mother. But again, it's, um, you know, it's in the pursuit of love. You have this sense that that it, this is very true to her character. Um, so I also, it's interesting, it was maybe that exchange right there that made me think that maybe um, some of, of what we are hearing both Fanny and Linda say is a reflection of the fact that Nancy Mitford herself never was able to have children, really wanted to have children. So it, it may be a little bit of a, um, you know, uh, like a way of, of, of sort of healing her, her sadness by, by making motherhood seem so terrible. Uh, on page 99 here, this is uh, when Fanny and Alfred are talking together. However, even he was forced to admit that her behavior to poor little Moira was not what it should be. The child was fat, fair, placid, dull, and backward, and Linda still did not like her. The Krasigs, on the other hand, adored her, and she spent more and more time with her nanny at Plains. They loved having her there, but that did not stop them from ceaseless criticism of Linda's behavior. They now told everybody that she was a silly society butterfly hard-hearted neglector of her child. So again, what I like here is the complexity. Fanny is not, a, a, she's not a type. She's a very round character in that 
she, you know, she has her four children and she talks at one point about being happily, you know, sort of not super happily, but like mostly happily settled into her life at Oxford. But she also um, is able to apprise Moira with a certain objectivity and with a certain brutality here as a, you know, fat, fair, placid, dull, and backward. So you have this idea of Fanny as not being appalled. She's not like, oh my God, Linda, you have to love your baby. And, and I think that allows the reader to understand a little better that, that this was a decision that, that Linda was going to make and that we should also understand. Okay, our last look at maternity is on page 177. And this, um, so this is after after she has to leave Paris and she has to leave with the, the bulldog, the French bulldog that she's leaving uh, with. And Fanny says, how did you get the dog out? Under my coat, said Linda laconically. You should have heard him grunting and snuffling. It shook the whole place. I was terrified, but he was so good. He never budged. And talking of puppies, those ghastly crasigs are sending Moira to America. Isn't it typical of them? I've made a great thing with Tony about seeing her before she goes. After all, I am her mother. So the part that I loved here is, um, and, and talking of puppies, those ghastly crasigs are sending Moira to America. So there's this sense of, of, of Moira as being, you know, even less beloved, in fact, than the dog, but sort of having a dog be sort of the same level as any children you might have. And then this idea of sort of standing on ceremony and, and this idea of her being the mother. I do think it's so funny too, when, when she has the meeting with Moira and she's gonna give her something beautiful and then decides she doesn't want to and gives her instead like an old watch, um, which whenever a watch pops out in any sort of literature, you should think of, of time and death and time passing. So. It's actually very kind of um, sad. Again, that here's this balance of, of comedy and sadness. Um, she gives the watch to, to Moira and Moira is in fact very happy. But when they have their one conversation, Linda's actually pretty awful, you know, and tells Moira that she does not approve of her running away from her country. Uh, you know, and I think if you consider that her father is Uncle Matthew, she comes by this honestly. But, but there is this sense of, of, of really being kind of a terrible parent to Moira in that exchange. Uh, and, and also this sense of um, like, she cannot believe that Moira is not excited about air raids, you know? And, and it turns out that Fanny's boys, of course, can't get enough of them because it's also exciting. But, but there's this sense of, of Linda as, as feeling very disconnected from this daughter who in many ways feels much more like Tony's child than her own. Okay. So we're going to then move on to some humor. So we, we've talked in bits and pieces as, we, as we've moved on about the humor. And, and um, I think what is so interesting here is a lot of it is sort of verging on satire. It's, it's a little satirical in some ways, but it's also just reveling in, in, in sort of the audacity of some of what went on, like hunting the children. Uncle Matthew hunting the children or, um, you know, things like calling your baby, you know, equal to your, your puppy, that sort of thing. But there are lots also of, of kind of one liners that we see. And I'm just going to read a couple of them um, when they're talking about Aunt Emily having been uh, engaged. They say it's not as though she could be in love. She's 40 which is so funny. I mean, it just, and again, that's kind of a throwaway one liner, uh, but it's, 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 it's very good. Then um, this next line, the rabbits loved animals. They loved foxes. They risked dreadful beatings to unstop their earths. They cried. Nevertheless, more than anything in the world, they loved hunting. So th there's a middle section there where she goes on and on about how they cried about this fox and that fox. So you have this long paragraph about how much they loved animals and loved them and unstopping their earths. So a fox's earth is their den. So presumably when they would be hunting the foxes, they would, um, you know, stop up their dens so that they wouldn't be able to like, you know, the, 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 the sort of hunting whatever people like the helpers would go through and stop up all the dens with with soil so that the hunt, the foxes couldn't go down into them but what happens then of course is that you know they they can't save themselves and so the children are going and unstopping their earths so an earth for a fox is is a den you know quick note on that front and this is another deft thing that that Nancy Mitford does 
she really flatters the reader often. Like in this case, when she says, she, you know, they, they unstopped their earths. Um, th there's this sense of, of the reader, she's trusting the reader to understand what that means. And I did not know what that meant. I mean, I, I kind of could figure it out. But, but when she talks about hunting, there's all of this language that's very specific to hunting that I did not understand. And, um, but, but, but it's very flattering because she is trusting the reader. To, and, and even if you don't understand it all, you're, you're like, okay, this is some kind of minutia about hunting. If she had like written it out or she hadn't used those terms of art, meaning the terms for hunting, you, 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 it would have felt very dumbed down. As it is, it feels very sophisticated and it feels like you're really entering this world and, and she's trusting you to understand what makes this world work and how it ticks at, because she's not in fact dumbing things down. So, and we're gonna look at a, at a part two uh, pretty soon where she, there's verbatim French, she writes some French and there's no translation for any of the French that's in the book and there's quite a bit and it, it, some of it's very funny. So the other thing that this humor is doing in this case, when we're talking about the foxes and, um, and, and this idea of their love of hunting is this, this sense of contradiction in these people, you know, that Linda is so passionate about love and yet she doesn't seem to feel love for her child or that, um, you know, she's the favorite of Uncle Matthew and yet he treats her so cruelly and turns her out of the house and won't let her back in. Um, there, there is this constant contradiction. So not only in the beginning did we get that amazing description of their their very volatile emotions in this household, but they also are, are, are containers of these internal contradictions that simply exist. You know, they love foxes, they love all of these things, and yet they also, more than anything, love to hunt. So I love the idea of both Fanny and Nancy Mitford as, as sort of positing this idea that, that contradictions are life. This is this is how life is. You know, lots of people have contradictions and 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 they are fine and lovable. Okay, I want to move on to one of my favorite characters, Davy, who is so charming. I find all of his weird diet things just so he's very lampoonable, but then he also is very close with Lord Merlin, and turns out he's he's very accepting of all of Linda's you know, uh, crazy raciness. So there's this real sense of him as being kind of priggish and, and, and sort of uptight and, and kind of like a germ phobe. But then he also really appreciates, uh, you know, at one point says the, the world wouldn't be the same without Linda in it. Uh, but when they're talking about childbirth and how the women are talking about childbirth and how terrible it's going to be to deliver their babies, and Davy says, but think how much good it will do you in the long run, said Davy enviously. Such a wonderful clear out. So I love that. And the genius thing there actually is the adverb. So most writers, you know, and all of the advice about writing says to avoid adverbs. Most writers use them badly. Uh, Nancy Mitford here is using this so, so well. So again, he says in the long run, it'll be so great. He said enviously, you know, he's, he's envious of the fact that they're really going to get to clean out their, their systems, such a wonderful clear out. Um, so I, I, I love, um, there are these comic types, you know, from uncle Matthew, who's just this like hilarious, larger than, I mean, he's also cruel and terrible, but you have, you just have these incredibly uh, vivid and rounded and contradicting, uh, characters. Okay. So now we have covered maternity and we've looked at the humor in the book. And now we, I want to spend a, a bit of time here talking about the tone of the book. So in the intro, again, Zoe Heller has something very wise to say on page 13 here. In the beginning of the uh, introduction here, Zoe Heller says, the pursuit of love may be reasonably described as a comic novel a light comic even, but it is too spiky and intelligent, I think, to qualify as an altogether cozy or comforting novel. So a cozy novel in, in the UK is, is like a, um, it, it's kind of, it's, it's like a granny novel. It's like something that's very, it's maybe like not an Agatha Christie, but, but something um, very kind of cozy and, and well, it's what it sounds like. It's a cozy novel. And in fact, Agatha, one of the reasons I mentioned Agatha Christie is because there is a cozy, there's a lot of debate about whether her novel or whether her mysteries fall in this cozy novel category. But 
it's it, it, what, what Zoe Heller is pointing out here is the spiky intellectualness. And I love that there's a spiky intelligence to these books that cannot be denied and that really does elevate them from comedy. But the thing that I would argue is, is more important in terms of elevating it above a light comedy is really a lot of the pathos. So um, a lot of it is very sad. The Spanish Civil War, so we, again, Nancy Mitford herself went down and joined her husband, Peter Rod. So she had firsthand experience. Um, and, and it's really such a great plot twist because of course she goes down there to be with Christian and then Lavender Davis is down there. And I think that you could think that that was awfully convenient that Lavender Davis happened to be there and that it happens to be this person that we had met earlier in the book. But first of all, it didn't bother me at all. I'm not sure it bothered you, hopefully not. But also there's this sense of, of you know, the expat community and, and the community of British, you know, um, like upper crust people who are down there uh, trying to help in the war effort. You imagine that's a fairly tight community. So it doesn't feel far-fetched to me and it doesn't feel kind of uh, overwrought. So I, I, I love I love that that plot twist. And it's just perfect. Again, the BBC adaptation is is so good. But Lavender Davis as being this really boring person, she's the perfect soulmate, in fact, for Christian. So you have um, the, the, the sadness of this Spanish Civil War and this idea of, of um, you know, the, the young brother, Matt, as running off from Eton. And you, you have this sense of, of impending war. And then Nancy Mitford does a very good job of, of, of describing the, the phony war and, and the suspense and all of this kind of anticipation about the war. So on page 144 and 145, we're going to look at the war. So right over here on, on this side on 145, this is when um, we have Linda is talking to uh, Fabrice. This is when she's crying at the Gare du Nord. She's at the train station crying there. So Fabrice says to her, ah, you come from Perpignan. And what were you doing there in the name of heaven? In the name of heaven, we were there trying to stop you frogs from teasing the poor Espanyards, said Linda with some spirit. Espanol. So we are teasing them, are we? Not so badly now, but badly at the beginning. And then if we go across the page, so she's kind of standing up. She can't even say Spanish, you know, in Spanish. Like she's so ill-equipped and yet is very sort of passionate about, about this idea of going down and having helped the refugees from Spain who have just come into France. So then across the page here, this is poignant because what Fabrice is doing here is he's really a voice of reason. And that voice of reason is really foreboding in lots of ways. He says, my dear Linda, you could hardly expect us to turn them loose on the countryside with no money. What would be the result? Do use your common sense. You should mobilize them to fight in the war against fascism that's coming any day now. Talk about what you know, and you won't get so angry. We haven't enough equipment for our own soldiers in the war against Germany that's coming. Not any day, but after the harvest, probably in August. Now go on telling me about your husband. It's very much more interesting. So, um, I mean, there that is not maybe the most evolved idea of, of keeping them, you know, sequestered, the, the refugees. But, but it, it, what we have here meaning Fabrice sounds like kind of a bore at the beginning of this explanation. But when he makes the point about how even the French are kind of under equipped, you have this this sense like, again, this is a, 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 an example of dramatic irony where we as readers know more about what is coming. And we know, in fact, that, that the war is going to be absolutely horrific for the French. And so there's this idea, this this kind of practical consideration that they do not have enough weapons for themselves let alone the thousands of refugees who are coming in, you, you, you have this very uh, subtle detail about the impending war, World War II, that, that's just, it just makes you like, oh gosh, this is, things are gonna get ugly. And in fact, things do get uglier. So let's look at 165. Um, and, and this is when uh, Fabrice is going to let her stay in France, but says, to, in Paris, but says, you have to promise me that you will leave the minute I tell you to leave. All right, said Linda, I solemnly swear. I don't believe anything dreadful could happen to me, but I promise to do as you say. 
Now will you promise that you will come to London as soon as it's all over and find me again? Promise? Yes, said Fabrice, I will do that. So I don't know about you, but this idea of um, when she says, I don't believe anything dreadful could happen to me, part of me was like, ooh, ooh. Uh oh. And if you were a careful reader in the very beginning and really took stock of that first paragraph about how poignantly sad family groups are, uh, you know, you have, and they're, they're little forebodings as we move along here that things are not going to work out as well as Linda might like. You, you, you have this sense of like, oh gosh, like this war that is barreling toward you is, is going to be really, really awful. Uh, let's look at 173. So this is um, this is this is when Linda is pregnant and she when when the Blitz comes at one point and or one of the Blitzes and then she has to the the there's a big bombing and she has to move out of the apartment on um, on Cheney Walk. I have the best. I already said this in section one, but I have such great images. There's a, a bunch of pictures of of Cheney Walk and and the homes there, and it's um it was so fun to pull together images for this uh, lecture. They can be found. Uh, through the foxpage.com on my YouTube channel. But here we have this description uh, of, of Fanny describing how Linda felt during the time when she was awaiting the birth of Fabrice's baby. Linda often thought of the expression fin de siècle, another example of, of not translating, although that's a phrase I think a lot of people know, which simply means um, end of the century. There was a certain analogy, she thought, between the state of mind which it denoted and that prevailing now, only now it was more like fin de vie, so the end of life. It was a thought, it was as though everybody around her and she herself were living out the last few days of their lives, but this curious feeling did not disturb her. She was possessed by a calm and happy fatalism. So a couple of different things are happening here. One. I mean, she's she's having th this 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 kind of sense of fin de vie, this this end of life. Like she's she's really kind of coming to terms with the fact that you know she's heading into childbirth. She, in fact, does know that the doctor said after Moira that she should not have any more children. So you know, childbirth would be scary enough in 1945, but Linda has extra reason to feel fatalistic about it. But you also have, um, because the, she's tying it with this fin de siècle and this fin de vie, the end of the century and the end of, of, of life for the entire community, you, you have this, this sense of, of foreboding. Uh, and then, and, and, and this idea of her being content and happy I, is very important when we get to the end of the novel. Now we're going to look at pages 203 and 204. This part I found so um, like it. It was so sad, really. It was it was very and so well earned and so well done. This was to me the perfect amount of pathos because it still had a little levity and a little humor. So this is when um, uh, at, the, at the end of the of the book, um, Linda gets the letter from Fabrice and and hands it to Fanny. She's crying and crying and crying because she can't understand it. She gave me a sheet of the thinnest paper I ever saw on which were scratched, apparently with a rusty pin, a series of perfectly incomprehensible hieroglyphics. So they go and they, they she tries to figure it out. She can't, they go find Davy, of course, because he solves all of their problems. Um, next page. Davy said she was quite right to ask him. I am very good at French handwriting. Which again is this kind of funny joke. It's this very sad moment. She's got this letter. And as a reader, you're like, what does the letter say? Like it's it's really a very taut moment. And when she's talking about the rusty pin and the hieroglyphics, and and then he says, I'm good at French handwriting, it's this very, I think, a very nice dig, you know, on the part of the English with this with just the notion of French handwriting as as somehow being totally indecipherable. Only you won't laugh at it, Linda said, in a breathless voice like a child. No, Linda, I don't regard it as a laughing matter any longer, David replied, looking with love and anxiety at her face, which had become very drawn of late. So we're, we're kind of hurtling toward the end of the book and, and this idea of her not looking great and of, of this fatalism, we're, we're really, there's some, there's some signposts here that should be preparing us for Linda's demise. And then more about the letter, he cannot decipher it. In the end, Linda had to give up. 
Never mind, she said. One day the telephone bell will ring again and he'll be there. So she says that line and then we have a space break. Nancy Mitford's use of the space break is so good. Again, it, you know, between the fatalism and her not looking good and this letter coming that she simply cannot decipher and Fanny can't decipher it and Davy can't decipher it. I mean, and the reader is just like, oh my God, like what, like, what does he have to say? And, and, and this, this kind of fatalism of, 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 you know, the phone will ring and it will be him, but, but you're like, mm, will it? And does she really believe that? It's, it's very sad. And then the last part we're going to look at in terms of this pathos uh, is on page, um, oh, I want to look first, before we look at the last instance of the pathos, I want to look again at the introduction on page uh, 20, page 20 of the introduction. Okay, um, so on page 20 here, XX, in case my children are watching and they can't do their Roman numerals, um, Zoe Heller says, Linda herself has shown us one further possibility that a life lived with passion and brio may have beauty and value, even if it, if even if one ends up with, quote unquote, nothing to show for it, and that the search for true love is a noble endeavor, whether or not it concludes in domestic bliss. So I love the fact, and that's the end of her introduction. I love the fact that she is really underscoring this pursuit of love, and that the pursuit of love is an end you know, it, 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 like it's a, it's a, a means to its own end and it, or an end. I don't, I can't, that expression is eluding me at the moment, but it is, um, it, it is, it's, it's enough. It's enough for her to be, um, you know, living this life in pursuit of love. It doesn't end in domestic bliss. She's not, you know, a natural mother. Um, and in fact, she's not going to get to mother, uh, Fabrice Jr. Uh, and, and, and in fact, she's not going to have a normal, sort of marriage and not not have a quote unquote successful marriage with anyone very much in fact like uh like nancy mitford and yet you do have this sense of of her as being a heroine and you have a sense you know of, of this novel as being a, a comedy and, and as being um sort of an optimistic thing in lots of ways but i want to look at one more instance of pathos and then at the very end of the novel on page 210 so this is when uh, Uncle Matthew is wanting them to blow up the the uh, Aladdin. So Aladdin is um, Juan, who is the Bolter's latest lover, uh, a Spanish chef, it turns out, has been putting away a lot of food. And Uncle Matthew, in fact, wants them to blow up Aladdin because they they uh, he, he this is Uncle Matthew's plan at the end is for them to blow it up. So um, we're going to read this down here. There's something about the the description of these preparations that really uh, moved me. So this is uh, Uncle Matthew talking. Now I must explain to you why I regard this as a most vital part of the operation. When Josh and Craven and I and all the rest of us have been killed, there is only one way in which you civilians can help, and that is by becoming a charge on the German army. You must make it their business to feed you. So you have Uncle Matthew in very matter of factly saying when I and all of the men, you know, who are more, uh, who have war experience, even though he's older, when, when we're all killed, the thing that you civilians have to do, and that includes Davy um, and the women, you have to basically make the Germans feed you and you have to become a burden. It's a terrible, terrible plan. But this this matter of fact way that he um, is 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 talking about his own death and then them all becoming prisoners of the Germans. And then especially this idea of um, uh, uh, like a, of this really bad kind of deluded plan that they're going to get rid of all of their resources in order to become a burden um, on the German army. N not only is it a, sort of a pathos ridden plan, but it's also just a very bad one. Uh, okay, so now we're going to move on to the very end of the book, which again, I think is this really beautiful uh, evocation of, of both pathos and of comedy. So on page 213 here. If anything happens to me, darling, you will look after Plon Plon, Linda said. Plon Plon being the dog. Plon Plon is a, um, it's a, it's a, a nickname for Napoleon which I think is funny. And of course, Fabrice would have been part of the naming of this French bulldog who is named after Napoleon. Apparently Napoleon couldn't say his name. And so he called himself Plon Plon, um, which 
makes sense. Um, and so then this dog, Plonplon, is named after Napoleon. He has been such a comfort to me all this time. But she spoke idly as one who knows, in fact, that she will live forever. And she mentioned neither Fabrice nor the child, as surely she would have done had she been touched by any premonition. So here I am thinking maybe Fanny is being a little naive. If you're watching the, the YouTube channel, this is my cat. This is the tale of Tabitha. Um, so I, I, I wonder here if Fanny is maybe not reading Linda uh, entirely correctly. And I think maybe Linda is having a bit of a premonition and is saying, watch this dog for me. Because also I think she understands that she will not be reunited with Fabrice and that uh, the, the, the child you know, her other child is being taken care of. So she assumes someone will do that. A little uh, further down. On the 28th May, both our babies were born, both boys. The doctor who said that Linda ought never to have another child was not so much an idiot after all. It killed her. She died, I think, completely happy and without having suffered very much. But for us at Alkenley, for her father and mother, brothers and sisters, for Davy and for Lord Merlin, a light went out, a great deal of joy that never could be replaced. At about the same time as Linda's death, Fabrice was caught by the Gestapo and subsequently shot. He was a hero of the resistance and his name has been a legend of France. So it is remarkable, again, with this pacing of this novel, it is, it's remarkable to have these longer drawn out scenes that are so beautifully wrought and, and so detailed and so satisfying and rich. And then to deliver matter of factly these two deaths back to back in these paragraphs, especially the Fabrice one, um, because, well, that is not true, especially the Linda one, because it's kind of couched um, in this it, it's masterful because it's couched in this sort of um, this comment about the doctors. So I actually misread it. I'm going to read it again here. The doctors who said that Linda ought never to have another child were not so much were not such idiots after all. It killed her. So this idea of of, of the doctors not being idiots, you're like, wait, what? And then it says it killed her. So th that this suddenness with which we are finding it out and the, and the kind of confusion that we have if we're like, wait, we're re remembering the thing about the doctors having said the thing before about um, after Moira's death, um, wow, after Moira's birth. Um, as the reader, you're kind of recalling all of this. And the reason why this is so masterful to me is because this is the way that hearing about Linda's death might have felt, certainly if you were Davy, uh, I don't think probably anyone was in the room with Linda when she's in there with the doctor. I don't really see this era, um, you know, people, you know, having a doula and all the family round, round and about. So I imagine, you know, that a doctor emerged from the room and told them that Linda had died and, and probably didn't say it that blatantly. Although in this case, I mean, Nancy Mitford is not mincing terms here she's saying it killed her um which is interesting too there's a lot of like anti-maternity sentiment there that i think um again nancy mitford probably feels very keenly but 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 you have this sense of of being kind of confused and and shocked by by the brutal fact of it because th this is the way that it would have been if you were davy or uh, poor fanny you know it's her, her very closest friend uh, and the person you know Fanny herself has just given birth. So Fanny's definitely not in the labor room with Linda, you know, so she would have been elsewhere, has her baby and then finds out this news. It, it would feel exactly the way that it did in this paragraph where you hear this kind of medical thing and then you find out that this thing has killed her, followed quickly on the heels of the death of Fabrice. Turns out in real life, Gaston lived to be 83 years old and died of cancer. So um, Nancy Mitford gave Fabrice a very different fate than the one of Gaston. So then that is not, however, the close of the novel because again, this novel is the perfect combination of levity and pathos. On the very last page, we have, it's, it's I love the fact that the novel ends with a conversation between the bolter and, uh, and Fanny 
So this is a mother daughter relationship that, you know, the bolter is back and she is now living with them with Juan and, and, and there is a sense of her as being this incredible grandmother and, and really being involved and being present in, in a way that, that is, um, it's very satisfying. And she's, she is having this sort of conversation with Fanny that, that, uh, you know, indicates, uh, some intimacy. So on page 214. Poor Linda, she said with feeling, poor little thing. But Fanny, don't you think perhaps it's just as well? The lives of women like Linda and me are not so much fun when one begins to grow older. I didn't want to hurt my mother's feelings by protesting that Linda was not that sort of woman. So this is a lot of debate in the novel about whether or not Linda is that sort of woman. I think you can argue it um, mostly. You can argue that she is quite like the bolter, but I think the real interesting thing here is that the bolter, in fact, is someone who's relatively sympathetic. So then, then um, the uh, the bolter is saying, "But I think she would have been happy." Sorry, this is Fanny speaking. But I think she would have been happy with Fabrice. I said he was the great love of her life, you know. Oh, darling," said my mother sadly. "One always thinks that every every time." So I just love this book. I love the ending. I love the beginning. I love the middle. Um, I hope that you also enjoyed it. And I hope that you uh, learned something from the lecture and that you will head to thefoxpage.com and find another, uh, another amazing book to read alongside with me. Thank you for listening.